when I began doing research about 40 years ago, I used both the social and a biological perspective. Uh, and at that point in time, those two perspectives were not partners. They weren't even distant friends. Uh, the biological scientists thought social factors were irrelevant because they were relatively late evolutionary developments. And even if they were relevant, they were too complicated to understand. Uh, social scientists were equally acrimonious toward biological perspectives. Uh, the thought was that uh, by the middle of the 20th century, we had already seen two world wars, a Great Depression, and a mountain of social injustices. So forget trying to understand the brain and biology. That was too complicated to be of any use. We needed to turn to try to build better societies and better communities. Uh, based on what we could understand about individuals' situations and their behavior. And so there was this antagonism between the two approaches. It seems obvious that ultimately, if we're going to understand human behavior, the human mind, we have to understand not only how the situation and social factors impact us, but also how the biological factors impact both of those mechanisms. And so uh, I've pursued it from the very beginning. Uh, and over time, uh, those two perspectives have become friendlier. Now they are in full partnership, and it is just one area of psychological science in the 21st century where you see very diverse perspectives being used, being combined now, to give us a more complete, comprehensive understanding of how the mind works and what underlies behavior. One very simple example, uh, rhesus monkeys. Male rhesus monkeys have testosterone just like humans. And sometimes we study the testosterone in those kinds of monkeys to understand how it might operate in humans. Uh, research going back uh, several decades now has shown that the level of testosterone in those rhesus monkeys predicts sexual advances toward females in the colony. Probably not a big surprise how biology is affecting social behavior. What is equally important and powerful though, and less well known, is that the testosterone in those monkeys is a function of the availability of receptive females in the colony. I kind of think, of, think about it as the brain in biology has a heart. Right? It's being shaped by what the social environment invites, what's there to take advantage of. And so there's this very nice reciprocal determinism. It isn't that the social is governing the biology, the biology is governing the social, but rather they're working together in this reciprocal fashion. And so that's an example of how the two perspectives are being brought together to provide a more comprehensive understanding of behavior and how the mind operates. I have served and continue to serve on a couple committees uh, that help advise the, the U.S. government about what might be important areas. Uh, at the National Institutes of Health, I currently serve on the Center for Scientific Review Council. And there, uh, the, the notion is to help NIH uh, do better peer review. and identify the most important areas of science to fund. One of the most exciting advances I've seen in these committees is the growth of interdisciplinary science. The, the importance of bringing massive interdisciplinary scholars together from different universities in order to solve big problems. When you think about it, big problems require lots of different answers, lots of different perspectives. So in the 20th century, you had these various fields of study uh, that actually uh, appear in introductory psych in the table of contents as separate chapters. And they were fields of study that were pursued separately. They each had their own journals. And we read our, quote, canonical journal, that journal in our field. And that's the journal to, in which uh, we sought to publish our best research. In the 21st century, uh, those boundary conditions are largely gone. We're reading everybody else's uh, uh, journals as well. Uh, we're publishing in uh, scientific journals, not just psychological journals, but nature and science. Uh, and then we have psychological science within psychology, which is read by the field writ large. The best research, middle of the 20th century, it was done by individuals, by single solitary geniuses. In the 21st century, it's done by teams of scientists. Those teams are increasingly likely to be interdisciplinary and multi-institutional. Uh, so science uh, has transformed how we actually, as faculty, as scientists, are doing our work. To ask those big questions, one now works in these very complicated teams with lots of expertise, with everyone sharing that expertise, not just contributing their piece, but sharing and arguing with one another to really advance our understanding of the big problems that we now face as, as a, a society and as a world. A second feature that I've really appreciated 
and have enjoyed is the centrality of psychological science. Psychology has emerged as one of the seven hub science. Mathematics, physics, chemistry, material sciences, earth sciences, medicine, psychology, and social sciences. Uh, and so it, you look and you say, well, how could that be? But think of all the big problems we face. Uh, poverty, a huge psychological component, behavioral component. Global warming, do you know how little global warming would be a problem if humans changed what they did? If we were more likely to conserve energy, if we uh, all uh, were to be uh, likely to turn down the heat and turn off the lights as we left rooms. Pandemics are one of the big problems that we face as a global society. Uh, in 1918, the Spanish flu led to 100 million deaths worldwide in a single year. Bird flu uh, is uh, basically the same virus and has the threat of even more global uh, damage uh, and mortality if it were to go uh, pandemic. And whether or not bird flu goes pandemic is largely behavioral. Uh, one of the threats for going pandemic is, for instance, air travel. Uh, it might emerge in a particular uh, local community and somebody goes on a jet, a transatlantic or transpacific flight, uh, and by the time they get off, that has spread in so many different directions, it's hard to bring that genie back in the bottle. And so the behavior is really important to understand if we're going to keep pandemics at bay so we can protect uh, global health. And so all of these major health problems and major problems that we see as a global society have a central behavioral component. And for that reason, psychological science has become especially important to help deal with these problems that we face.